Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We are thrilled to have you in the discussion in preparation for our conference coming up on the 5th of June in Madrid, our Iberia Solar Summit. Our title of our webinar today is our shared power market conditions, uh, where we aim to discuss uh, declining capture prices, uh, topics like curtailment, and our market saturation as well. So, a bit of an overview about myself. My name is Marco Pistana. I am the project manager at Solar Plaza and also the program developer for Iberia and for our upcoming conference in Madrid, as well as our storage event that's coming up in October in Madrid as well. Exciting news, we are excited to offer a 20% discount on the conference that I just mentioned to all participants within the webinar today. We do have the exclusive discount code that's visible on your screen. Please do make use of this code as it will give you a further discount on your tickets. It's available for one week, so there is a limitation on when you are able to uh, redeem this code. Um, share it with your network as well, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you at our event. A bit of an overview, so our webinar title today in preparation for our conference is Power Market Conditions in Iberia. We are, as I said earlier on, we are focusing on strategic approaches to mitigating things like declining capture prices, curtailment, uh, power market saturation, we, as we will also have uh, you know, various different topics that will be inclusive in this conversation among our panelists today. And a overview of Solar Plaza, your event company hosts, as, as well as our coordinators, with a mission to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. Solar Plaza was formed, developed, and launched in 2004 and we've just recently celebrated our 20 year anniversary as a company, two decades in the making on global solar conferences. We are based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So far we've done 200 plus uh, successful solar conferences throughout various uh, countries and continents around the world. Um, 47 plus to be precise, we have a network of 60,000 plus uh, solar PV professionals, key stakeholders, companies that we've worked with in the past. Um, on your screen, you will find a, a link or a, a name to our website and to our network and platform where you will get your further information. And we, are, we cover everything from white papers, webinars, articles, infographics, newsletters, uh, you know, various things that covers the, the topics within the solar PV market that is current, trending, and also a reflective um, uh, piece of, of knowledge. Thank you. A bit of practical notes on our webinar today. You would have a question box on the top right-hand corner of your screen, and I do encourage all participants to send your questions through. We will try our best to have them answered throughout uh, throughout our our webinar, and at the end, everyone will be addressed to the best of our capabilities and to the capabilities of our panelists. If you have or experience any technical issues, please do make use of your uh, Q and A box. Uh, send through any issues that you might be experiencing, and we will try to have them resolved for you. And the, this uh, presentation, our our discussion today, will be available between 24 to 48 hours once the conference has been concluded. Thank you. As we move through our introduction, we will have a discussion on the topic at hand today, which, as I said earlier, is in preparation for our conferences, which we do have a panel uh, overseeing and having this discussion live and in person, we will have the opportunity to network with our panelists, uh, with uh, people within the audience that's relative you know, to what your requirements are. And it will be followed by a Q&A once the webinar has been concluded and the topics are discussed and done. Thank you. 
I now introduce our moderator as well as a panelist for our upcoming conference, Mr. Thomas Garcia from JLL. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for the introduction and, and thank you Solar Plaza for organizing this webinar, for giving us the opportunity to participate and, and to share some insights with the audience. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Tomas Garcia. I, I work for JLL. Um, we are financial advisors supporting our clients in, in acquiring, uh, disposing or raising capital uh, for their renewable energy assets and storage assets. Um, we do it across um, Europe and I head up the team here in, in Iberia. Um, so maybe I would like to, before we go to the introductions of the rest of the panelists, provide a little bit of context um, for this webinar. So as, as everyone um, that is attending is aware, power market conditions um, in Spain and Portugal in the middle um, are extremely challenging, um, especially lately. We're suffering um, from a lot of volatility for very low prices, very low capture prices for both solar and wind, and also a significant amount of curtailment. So the discussion today is about um, how to mitigate those risks. What can we do as an industry to try to solve those issues. Um, and there is more questions than answers, but this, it tends to be a forum for my expert panelists um, to provide some ideas on what can be done. Um, so this is a bit of the context um, of the webinar today. So with that, let me hand over uh, for themselves to introduce um, them. So maybe Fernando, you wanna start first? Yes, uh, fantastic. Thank you, Tomas, and thank you, Solar Plaza, for organizing this uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is Fernando Salinas, and I'm I work in FRB, FRB, which is a, a, an IPP that owns around 3,500 megawatts that are, are either under operation or construction worldwide. We uh, basically are operating in Australia, uh, South America, and Mexico, uh, and also. Um, uh, Australia and Spain. Uh, I am the managing director for the Iberian business, where we actually operate uh, 1200 megawatts. Uh, we're currently operate 1200 megawatts. No? Uh, we also are um, very um, investing in, in batteries and, and new technologies through a platform called FRBX. And, um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Alberto? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, Solar Plaza, for the introduction and uh, for the organization. I'm Alberto Clavarino. I am part of our company, which have more than 3 giga of installed capacity, out of which uh, 2.6 uh, gigawatts of um, uh, onshore uh, wind and the rest uh, in uh, solar. Um, I joined ERG in 2018. I'm, I'm the responsible for business development uh, AMA uh, since uh, um, 2022 in Spain. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, in case there is anyone in the call that doesn't know Ruger, please, Ruger, can you introduce yourself? Well, hi, my name is Ruger Fon. I'm the head of uh, Project Finance Energy in Banco Sabadell. And as some of you already know, we have been one of the most active banks in Spain, and we have structured more than five or six gigawatts in the last few years. Great, thank you. So <clears throat> I was playing with my phone uh, right now. This wasn't prepared, sorry, Bo. But um, this is what we're trying to talk about today. So this is basically the website from OMIE, uh, and it shows um, as you can see, a huge volatility in power prices. This is the day ahead price. So a huge volatility from power prices, and especially in the last, in the last uh, few weeks, very, very low prices. So this is what it's about. Um, and, and the discussion is, what can we do about it? And, and, and we at GLO have talked to a lot of people. We continuously talk to lots of you know, investors, fans, IPPs, utilities, and developers as well. 
And, and what we hear, especially from those players that have um, operating projects that are suffering from these low prices from this full time is that many of them are actually trying to hybridize their existing plants. So for example, if they have a solar PV plant, they're trying to combine it with wind or add some batteries. So hybridization could be one potential solution. So perhaps Alberto, uh, you guys at ERD do have operating plants in Spain. You are also developing plants. So uh, what are you doing about hybridizing your, your plants? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, first of all, we have launched a program to repower many ARX assets uh, and uh, in Spain uh, uh, is current under investigation. Uh, we do have uh, operating assets, but we have as well constraints such as rare regime or PPAs. So right now we're focusing on the asset with uh, a better potential and uh, let me say an exposure to uh, merchant price. Uh, I think that uh, um, right now the re-permitting, let's call it, uh, um, is really, really long because it has a maximum compliance time up to five years. And I think this uh, should be cut in order to speed up and install, uh, for example, more uh, batteries. Um, we really believe in BES and uh, so I think that uh, at some point uh, they will come. Uh, I think that the solar plus BES uh, uh, could solve curtailments uh, with time and the wind plus BES uh, could stabilize the grid. Fernando, are you also trying to re-permit and add batteries or combine with wind? Yeah, look, certainly. Uh, but we all know that adding wind to solar is not that is as easy, no? Where there, there's not always resource, no? Where we are doing so where, 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 where we actually can do it. We are also, uh, you know, in terms of batteries, we've been successful in four government programs of uh, for hybridizing four of our projects with uh, with batteries and we're working are you on that to the, are you referring to the subsidies by idai in the perfect program by idai yeah that's that's correct so we were for, uh, successful in four of those projects and we even though the timing is challenging and uh, permitting is taking longer than expected um, but uh but we're trying to comply with our timelines and we're trying to obviously it's uh it's, a, it's one of our targets to our hybridize these assets. And we are doing this first. The others may come afterwards, but, uh, but look, the other protection that we're, we're doing is basically the PPAs, no? We're all, all, almost 80% of our assets are hedged. 80% uh, uh, of the energy coming from the assets are, are hedged with long-term PPAs, with actually big companies. And that's probably the biggest protection. Uh, the thing is that we, if we introduce the concept of a battery, you typically need to go to the off-taker and renegotiate the PPA because the, the PPA is on a pay-as-produce basis. And if you actually capture a higher amount of price, then uh, you need to talk to the PPA provider and tell them that you're going to install a battery and that negotiation. I think the PPA providers will be open to it. So because they will have a protection, then they will have a higher capture price and probably they, they will have an additional source of revenue. Uh, but but uh, but then you need to pay the battery, no? so that's a challenge as well. So yes, we are trying to 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 do basically the same as Alberto has mentioned. Yeah, and um, and if you try to add batteries, you will also need the permission from the banks. Um, but before I go and ask about that to Rouge, um you both mentioned about the re-permitting. So if you have an um, existing operating, say, solar PV plant and you want to either combine it with wind or add batteries, you obviously need to get a new AAC, no? Autorización Administrativa de Construcción. So you need to re-permit the whole thing. So um, two specific questions. How long does it take to get a new AAC, including batteries, for example? And what are the key challenges in the process? Well, if I may, well, the first thing is that typically if you have a less than 50 megawatt assets and then you hybridize the asset that probably will go beyond 50 megawatts and then you don't have to uh, permit your asset through the local administration you need to go through the ministry and that complicates everything no uh, i think that's something that 
uh, from the ministry and from the local government, they need to organize themselves uh, better because that, from my point of view, doesn't make any sense. No, that's another layer of another layer of complexity that they are introducing. So in terms of timing, so we don't expect. I mean, we're going to take more than one year eh, to to actually get the permits for the hybridization of the assets, and uh, and knowing that the obviously the 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 complexities are are, are high, no? Because there there's been, I mean, obviously there's there there are always some design problems. You need to make sure of your design, and once you choose, then choose the interconnection. You request the interconnection point. Red Electrica takes its time, and then moving to the ministry instead of the local administration is always, as I said, another layer of complexity. So. So okay. it's it's not something that you do uh, on agile uh, and and try uh, and there's no fast track for that. So it's uh, it's something that you take it, it will it will take time to to finalize permitting. And Alberto, would you agree with about a year to get the return? Yes. I totally agree with uh, Fernando because uh, I mean, if you have to think that uh, if you take uh, first of all uh, the first step, access and connection, that is something that uh, you already have. Then uh, again, the DIA, then the IPP, then the um, authorization for construction, and then uh, the exploitation permitting. So the maximum compliance compliance time would be up to five years. Uh, and this, uh, I think, uh, uh, is too much period, especially for investors like us uh, that uh, could not wait uh, uh, such, you know, with this long-term view. So uh, I think sure. we need to speed up the process and I think the uh, government uh, uh, have to take some action. Okay. Roger, um, you guys have a significant exposure um, to power prices in, into the Spanish fleet. Of, of solar and wind plants, and I'm sure um, you're also observing, um, you know, how revenues perhaps are decreasing. Um, from a from a financing perspective, um, are you concerned? Well, obviously we are concerned because of the of the current volatility. Um, and it's something that we need to convince the, the different people that look at it that. They shouldn't look at, at, at a week or a month, but uh, the power trends, uh, the forecast in the future. No? And what has added to more volatility is the changes in the, in, the, in the forecast. That we know it's because of the gas or the drop of the gas futures. No? But that's what puts volatility into the business cases. And uh, if we look at our portfolio merchant, uh, most of the projects, all of those that were signed before 2023, uh, they shouldn't be in, affected because the break-even is much below what the, what the experts think it will be the year-end price. And those that have been uh, signed in 23, well, they may be a little affected and they may need a tweaking. But obviously, we are monitoring and we understand that the power of prices are more or less constant on a mid to long term. And then we need to work out on this short term volatility. And um, are, are you receiving, I mean, to the point that Fernando was saying before, um, are you receiving requests from sponsors of projects um, to change their projects, um, either by combining with wind or adding batteries, because if, if if they have finance in place, they will need your permission. Yes, we have a, our current portfolio in, in Iberia, it's around 160 transactions, more or less. Depends how you count them, but it's more or less 160. And I would say that in 30 or 40 of them, we have uh, been asked to, 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 to do a waiver. Uh, allow them to ask for the licenses to most of them for e hybridization, wind and solar. In some, in a few of them with batteries, but I think it's it's more in an early stages, or at least I think that, well, uh, here Alberto and Fernando can talk about it, but I think they're just trying to figure out uh, the economics of it. But yes, it's true that th there are the largest sponsors and the medium sized sponsors, but all the largest sponsor are thinking about hybridization. 
Yeah, cool. that's quite interesting. And that's very consistent with what we at JLL are observing when talk to, talking to um, sponsors in the market. Cool. Um, so Fernando, you touched upon PPAs earlier. Um, obviously, and, and also Alberto mentioned that 80% of your production is also contracted under PPAs. Um, obviously, PPAs are the um, most straightforward tool to manage this you know, price volatility risk. Um, but we are observing how also PPA conditions are being more challenging in the sense that you know lower prices, perhaps less appetite for pay as per use um, from off takers. So yeah, maybe Fernando, um, can you share some of the insights that you are um, lately observing on PPAs from both, let's say, traditional power utility kind of PPA off takers um, versus corporate off takers? Yeah, fantastic. So it's a great question, Thomas. So look, the, the reality is that what we're seeing is basically a gap in between what the capture prices that we are seeing under the curve that we receive from our advisors. Uh, any of the price advisors can give you a capture price for solar. And that, that doesn't provide an economic incentive to invest in solar. Uh, uh, so there's basically a gap in between that price, that capture price, and uh, the, P the PPA or the price, the PPA price that you would need in order to actually make your project a f a feasible and you and you achieve your basically your your minimum target IRRs or your economics, no? Uh, and that, and that, that, that can you go into the numbers? Yeah, and that's where you actually I see the corporate. And that's, and that's where you actually see the corporates coming. No? Uh, so the corporates will probably need to fill that gap and the government tenders will actually need to fill that gap. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that's how more projects will, have, will need to come online. Uh, obviously there won't be any projects done without uh, uh, reaching a minimum target IRR. No? And that's, uh, uh, that's something that of common sense, but uh, it's something that everyone will need to do the job. No, right now we are seeing demand declining. We're seeing a decoupling in between the GPI growth and the demand growth, which is something that we have not seen in the market before. And 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 also, and that's and we're we're seeing more generation coming online and demand and the demand not, not helping. No, so that's why we're having very low prices. Also, obviously, we're having a very rainy year, and that we have all the hydro coming online. And in terms of prices, right now. You can see captures prices in the low 30s in the low in the in the in the long term answering to your your question thomas and in terms of the price needed to make your project profitable that will depend on where you are located the level of irradiation we are also seeing interest rates that are not really coming down they're talking about them coming down but that's not really happening and we are also seeing the balance of systems uh, uh, prices going up and solar panels coming down so but in in general uh, you, you can see a range in between 35 to 40 lows uh, in order to make your project feasible for, for, for PPA pay as produce and you are seeing capture prices at the very low 30s. So the, as I said, there's a, there's a gap no and, 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 and I don't and, and well every one of us will actually need to make their numbers and see how, how you can fill that gap no in order to make your project happen. Okay. Let, let me just put some numbers on the table and see how Alberto and Ruggier react. Um, so for, a, let's say, a standard solar PV uh, PPA, so a PPA for a solar PV plant, pay as produce 10 years. Let's say for a very clearly investment grade off taker, the price would be just below 30, so not even 30. And for a non-investment grade uh, off taker, maybe low 30s whereas the corporates can be above 40. Um, would those numbers be more or less um, what you guys are observing in the market, both Alberto and Ruggie? I think uh, uh, that, uh, uh, go ahead, Roger, if you want. No, no, <laughs> no, I, no, no, just very quick. I think that what I've seen, first of all, the banks are the, the latest that we see the PPA prices because the sponsors negotiate them and then they go to the bank. So, but I think that I would say just above 30s for a PPA investment grade. 
uh, okay. uh, from an That's good. I was I was saying that uh, I I was thinking something between thirty and uh, forty euro megawatt hour for solar plants, of course, and uh, I'm talking about uh, as well floor price. So probably uh, you have a floor and uh, you have covered a certain percent of uh, uh, the volumes. Uh, what I wanted to add before when uh, uh, Fernando was talking, uh, I think that. Uh, uh, Spain uh, has always been ahead uh, delivering uh, at least uh, 33 PPA contracted uh, per year. Uh, last year was still good. Of course, uh, we had more PPAs on the solar side than wind uh, because of the installation. But at the end of story, to make your uh, project profitable, what really matters is the price. I think that there is a lot of appetite, but uh, the low prices uh, uh, don't attract investors and uh, uh, some corporate companies probably they are trying to push hard uh, and they are trying to securize a huge amounts of energy um, in this moment because the price is still low and uh, they are taking advantage of this moment okay and um, one of the challenges that we are also observing is curtailments um, so essentially, um, restrictions technicas where you have to stop your plant or actually red electrical will directly stop your plant. Um, can APPA mitigate that risk against curtailments? I think this is a really tough question. Not at all that uh, I know personally. If you have something uh, as well from the audience uh, please feel free to suggest uh, because uh, we'll take uh, uh, some comments and uh, the things is uh, i don't think that the clients will take uh, uh, this risk on their side i think it's a tricky question in a sense not tricky but there should be a long discussion about that but for us for us we have been monitoring uh curtailments um uh, in depth in our in our operating portfolio because we have suffered them. And some, well, the sponsors have suffered them, but have the infection. Then, one of the things that when we a client comes to sign the PPA is that do not go above seventy or seventy-five of P ninety. So, and years ago, we the more the PPA, the better. So, if it's eighty, eighty; if it's ninety, ninety percent. Happy to do that. But now we, we don't recommend to go above 70% of P90 because we have seen curtailments uh, and we know that uh, curtailments are happening. It's more difficult to see the curtailments in, uh, unless the sponsor tells us, but it's more difficult to see the curtailments in wind because in wind you have to, to, to see uh, the volatility of, of the wind. So if, if one project it's minus 11 percent of the p50 you don't know it's if it's because curtailment or if it's because uh, uh the wind the, the production but if in a pv it, it's minus 10 percent of the p50 you know that there has been curtailment so it has changes a little bit on on how we see the payers produce volume fix ppas to not go over a certain percent and before we go to Fernando, are those the type of levels that you're observing around minus 10 percent? In in in, in solar? Yes. Uh, no, in solar, if, if what we are seeing is that it's between if a project goes well, it's between zero and three per, minus three percent, minus okay. three, four percent. So it's in a in a correct range. However, the ones that have had curtailment, it has gone minus 15 and one of them more than 15 then when wow. they have uh when they have um uh, other i mean when they have joined us rap mm -hmm. then it has it has lowered the curtailment yeah this rap is really helping eh? um i was i was speaking to some rep representative from red electrica the other day and, and this lady uh, was explaining to me how this strap um, which, by the way, if anybody doesn't know about it, it has, it's an automatic system to reduce the production by Red Electrica um, before claiming um, an event of curtailment. Um, the SRAP is really helping manage curtailment 
um, and avoid these situations that Ruyo was explaining. So yeah, Strap is something, and very easy and cheap to install, by the way. Uh, uh, the Fernando, reality is that, uh, Thomas, the, the reality is that Strap is, 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 is there to mitigate. I mean, it will help mitigating, but it, 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 it does not remove the problem. So the problem- No, no absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Fernando, you wanted to comment uh, before on curtailments? Yeah, look, uh, uh, curtailment. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's here to stay in, 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 on solar PV. I will probably increase over the year. That will depend as well in the number of megawatts that come online and how demand evolves over time. Uh, look, if we think about the national plan that we here in Spain that we have, uh, which is basically right now we are at the level of 26 gigawatt of PV uh, and and around. 50 gigawatts of new PV needs to be installed up to 2030 in order to comply with our national plan. If that really happens and demand and demand doesn't uh, doesn't really happen, no, and demand doesn't really doesn't really come through, uh, then then they will be, we will see very high levels of curtailment. No? The other day, a consultant was telling me that around 10 gigawatts of of PV will probably will be curtailed in 2027-2028. So 10 gigawatts out of uh, 70 or 60 or 50 or whatever level we have at, up to that year is, is a very high number. Uh, will those will those projects happen if there's not an economic incentive uh, for them to happen? Uh, that's the big question. No, I mean, I think yeah. uh, I think investors will need to make their analysis and their investment analysis and see whether they we, they can make the project profitable or not. Obviously, batteries will help, and uh, but batteries we will need, we need mechanisms to make them happen as well, and that's yeah. uh, and that's for the government to 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 intervene and to actually help us. No, but uh, I think uh, curtailment. I think it's here to stay. We need to start to be comfortable with it and uh, it has to be in our plans no? yeah so speaking about what the government can help let me bring the discussion to the rare program the uh, régimen económico de energías renovables um, as you guys know um, the government launched a public consultation just a few weeks ago in order to revise the design of this rare auctions program um, they essentially want to add additional criteria not just a number not just a price but also add some qualitative criteria for example socioeconomic impact employment etc and that's under consultation so it seems that the government may launch new rare auctions this year but what do you guys think alberto um are you expecting rare auctions and if you are expecting rare, rare auctions what potential changes against the previous versions well, I think uh, so. My answer is yes. Uh, we'll expect uh, by the end of the year. Uh, let me say that uh, we will launch again some rare auctions, and uh, I think the most important things is to have uh, a floor price uh, just to be competitive versus the PPA, and uh, I think that they we need to uh, level uh, uh, the price uh, in order to have uh, adequate uh, uh, returns. Uh, on another note, as you were saying, uh, I think uh, um, we need to have more uh, transparency on the, the non-economic uh, aspects and criteria, uh, because uh, I really think uh, uh, that they are all uh, really important matters, such as the environmental aspects uh, or uh, uh, social plans. Uh, this is was as well uh, a bit of the idea of uh, the concurso de capacidad, something that uh, we all know <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is not coming uh, but so this uh, should be let me say objective and uh, measurable in some way um, uh, just to give you an idea of the price level uh, uh, I will try to push uh, I would like to see price for photovoltaic more than 40 euro megawatt hour and for onshore wind uh, we're talking about 80 uh, and I think this uh, will permit again uh, to um, return uh, with investment uh, in Spain uh, and as well to adequate the prices to the European level, which is higher respect to Spain. 
Uh, of course, you need to consider, uh, for example, for photovoltaic, uh, the load factors uh, uh, that is not so high in the other uh, European countries, such as Spain. Interesting numbers you've mentioned. Yeah, I remember the last edition was almost empty um, because the government set a very low cap price. Rouget, Fernando, what do you guys think about the rare auctions? Fernando, you want you want yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Roger. So, look, I, perhaps three messages. Uh, I think the government needs to choose projects with a certain advanced stage of development. Uh, I don't know whether to put the threshold in having the environmental permit. That would be a potential good idea, perhaps even more advanced. Um, so there are many, many projects right now that are in a very advanced permitting process that need to make that they need to see the light and they would probably need a PPA in order to make it happen. So those need to be on the focus uh, to make them successful. The, the second probably comment is, a, is I would introduce a, co a component of, of a storage uh, on the project uh, so, so they can actually can help the grid uh, and not basically curtail the other PV assets that are online, and they will probably be better. Uh, will be operating better. And uh, and the third thing is uh, is the price. No, you've touched based on that and the cap price. No, the latest, um, uh, the last actually uh, um, uh, tender Offer. that we saw. Uh, what the cap price was probably uh, we didn't uh, no, none of us uh, none of us got there no we we actually participated and they told us that we were very close but uh, we did, we were not uh, able to get the the, the PPA uh, because we were just above the cap no so government needs to need, they need to understand that the, the conditions today are still not easy so financing is not cheap interest rates have not gone down. Even the panel prices have reduced, but BOAs, as I said before, have increased, and, and cost of capital is going up as well. So because we are, they are seeing higher risk in in the assets. So so the reality is that the cap price uh, they, in, in, has to be well thought, and uh, and uh, it will probably have to go up. Yeah, yeah, agree, agree with those comments. Um, it would be. It would not be good if the next uh, auction um, gets empty as the last one. Um, so perhaps the cap price would be significantly higher. Um, Roger, from a financing perspective, um, I, I am mean, assuming. That... Oh, wow. What do you think? And, and, and one, what do you think about our auction? And one additional question for you on financing. Um, I guess um, a project awarded um, the the CFD mechanism um, will be potentially even more bankable or, or better financing conditions, no? Yes, I mean, regarding the, the auctions, I agree with what Alberto and Fernando said, um, and especially two points that, that, that Fernando mentioned. One, to award advanced stage uh, projects, because the biggest problems that I saw in the last auctions is that by, with the three or four years that they had, the interest rate had gone from zero to 3%. So, uh, and that completely changed the, the break even and the IRR and, and the prices that they needed. So, that was the biggest hurdle. And then, um, that they take into consideration when the government um, makes their expected price, they put into the consideration the interest rates at 3% for an IRS long term because it's not feasible to, to, to ask for a price that's below 35 or 30 if the interest rates are at 3%. And then regarding um, the CFDs, obviously we, we treat them as a PPA investment grade. So obviously it will have the best uh, the best type and uh, the, the maximum leverage, the more leverage, lower debt service cover ratio, longer tenors, and all that. And you still on financing, Ruge. Um are you, because Sabadell was one of the few banks in Spain that was able to finance full merchant plans. Um, with the current challenging power market conditions, are you still able to finance on a full merchant basis? 
I mean, we are a bank that we believe in merchant. However, it's true that in the last uh, two months, uh, the volatility of the last two months, we are taking a look at the prices. And it's true also that with the change in, 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 in price electricity forecast, we're also evaluating, uh, we are evaluating the, how we finance merchant and to see if we have to change anything from our structures, either tenor or the service cover ratio, probably a little bit more flexibility. So now at the moment we are currently analyzing all this. Okay. Let's, let's leave it there then. Um, then another, um, also try to be some, somehow, you know, imaginative and, and think a little bit out of the box. Um, you know, power markets are very complex, extremely complex environments. Um, and, and there is different um, markets in which generating plants can participate. I'm, re I'm referring more specifically to ancillary services. Um, for example, we at JLO are, are quite knowledgeable on, on storage and the, the revenue stack that storage facilities uh, can participate in. Uh, and, and they can be, you know, secondary market, tertiary market, technical restriction, replacement reserve. So there is a whole a range of other markets in which uh, power plants and battery plants can generate additional revenues. Um, so if we focus for a second on, on solar or wind plants, um, I know that um, many of the players um, operating these plants are also participating in some of these markets and actually generating additional revenues, especially from the secondary market. Um, it's a small, but in this situation, it's actually becoming more relevant. So let me ask you, maybe Fernando and Alberto, are you guys also with for your own plants? Are you guys thinking or even doing it already in participating in these um, ancillary services? Well, I can go first. So look, uh, uh, yes, we're doing so uh, for a year. We've been doing so for that for a year. The asset management take care of that, and the, the asset management team, and they've been doing a great job trying to basically try to operate be better operate our assets no uh, i cannot give you the detail of what's the percentage of revenue that we get from there but it's not really significant no it's uh, something that is i would say not relevant right now but we are trying we are learning about it we're trying to coordinate as well with the market operators and and try to 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 make you know uh, try to get the most of them of the market and uh, but yes we we are looking into that eh? uh, uh, that that also ob obviously uh, that goes along the conversation with batteries no? so and what markets needs to needs to government be focused on in order to be able to support the investment on batteries and uh, and how needs that i mean how 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 that will evolve in the future no uh, obviously uh, part of the biggest revenue that we are obtaining in other assets where we are invested in UK comes from all those that secondary market and over there there's a re relevant revenue coming from there and and that the same thing should happen probably in Spain no? but uh, look I leave it there and perhaps Alberto has uh, more ideas I think uh, uh, we are well I mean uh, we are investigating uh, this uh, let me say because uh, right now in Spain we have uh, 266 megawatts so this is something that uh, is under investigation uh, for example for best uh, both standalone or uh, best at uh, with hybridization uh, so yeah we're exploring we are you know looking at the same uh, uh, level that you were saying uh, the fact that uh, this component on the revenue stream uh, is really relevant it is really important uh, more for example than a capacity market uh, and so it's something that uh, we're looking at all right sounds good interesting so yeah from, from our perspective um, again we talk to a lot of people and we we see that um, the discussion becomes more complex, more sophisticated. It's more about understanding the intricacies of the power markets and the different services that power plants can participate in. Um, and by the way, the role of, of the optimizers or, or the traders or, or those guys that have the intelligence to decide 
from an operational perspective, um, when and how to participate in those markets is becoming more and more relevant. So um, the good old days in which you just produce power and sell it at whatever price um, are starting to be gone. Um, so yeah, this this is, is going to become more relevant in the discussion. So um, I think we can, unless you know, Solar Plus tells me that we're running out of time. Um, perhaps we can take um, one or two questions from the audience. So um, if anybody in the audience wants to pose any questions, uh, please do so in the in the chat in the Q and A, and and we'll try to answer those questions. In the meantime, while while we're getting questions from the audience. Um, one last question for me, which is a little bit technical. Um, have you guys heard about adding synchronous condensers to solar PV plants in order to mitigate the risk of curtailment? Well, not first time I hear that, Thomas, but, uh, but it is true that certain interconnection points have been, have been granted thanks to the, to, to the um, synchronous condenser. Uh, and, but look, the, the reality is that it's, uh, it's expensive. It also consumes energy and uh, it consumes around 8 to 10 percent of the energy that the asset produces. And, and uh, you need to put in a, in a very competitive a asset no and either wind or solar it will have to be very competitive in order to be able to uh, to receive i mean to actually uh, be able to absorb an eight percent or ten percent reduction of the generation no? so okay. in terms of of uh, yeah look i'm i'm not sure eh, about okay. your question but, but i could i could add that okay yeah maybe a little forward thinking um, so yeah, we've, we've, we're getting the first uh, questions coming in from the audience. Thank you very much for those. So there is someone that is asking about negative prices. Um, we have already starting to see negative prices in, in, in Spain. They are not surprising anymore. Um, so uh, the question is for, for Alberto and Fernando. So when there is negative prices, what do you do with their plants? Do you, do you stop them? You could tell yeah. them yourself, or what do you do? You sh you you could shut down the plants. That uh, basically it's gonna take uh, really two minutes, two three minutes. So you can uh, I can answer that. You can stop the plant. Yeah, that that will depend as well on the on the PPA that you have negotiated. No, you if if you need to achieve a certain level of generation, you are, and you are paid through your PPA, even if the if the price are negative or zero, then you probably be you probably keep on uh, operating the asset. No, if the if your PPA does doesn't have a protection on that then you'll probably have to shut it down in order not to be in order not to pay for that no? yeah so, so again, you, need again. To be, you need to be very Depends careful how you negotiate the the close while negotiating the ppa on that close yeah certainly yeah i, I remember negotiating those closes a few years ago was a lot more straightforward and easier than today <laughs> um yeah for enough good good another sign that um how operating the plants actively is becoming more and more important. Another question from the audience, maybe this one for Ruje, um, is around a potential insurance policies that can help mitigate some of the risks that we discussed uh, today. So are you guys from Sabadell um, either you know, observing potential insurances to cover these risks? We, we were offered by uh, Pier 1 a sponsor to, to introduce them, a kind of an insurance on, on solar production to mitigate weather factors, because this sponsor had been using it in the U.S., in Texas, I believe, or well, in several parts of the U.S. At this point, we, we, we didn't use it in Spain, but it's something that we'll monitor. But in the U.S., they are used. They are like part of the package. Yeah, so some potentially good practices uh, that we can import from other markets like the US. Let, let's see. I know that some of the insurance policies have been poly uh, insurance providers have been quite active in, in exploring these issues as well. And, and they come up with some solutions that sometimes you can't even think of. So something worth exploring at some point. 
there is one other question. Um, someone is asking about the challenges that we've mentioned when hybridization plants and, for example, getting the new AAC or potentially asking for permission to the debt. Um, and, and more specifically, um, this person is asking about those challenges when you want to add batteries to your solar plant. So anyone wants to comment on this? Well, I can go if you want to mask. So look, yes, those, this basically the case that we, that I was thinking of was actually that one, which is actually adding, uh, meaning adding batteries to the solar PV plant, no? which is uh, the case that we are facing. No? And those challenges are, are, are happening. So and I'm taking very, taking a lot of time to, to develop the assets. It's just uh, uh, also, uh, the way we are operating, we are learning from our experience in other countries and uh, such as uh, UK and uh, and look, uh, yes, it's those challenges uh, we are we are facing them. Yeah. And I think this is uh, crazy because if you think about storage, you need uh, less space than, for example, uh, um, hybridize with uh, another solar plant or a wind farm. So. Uh, this should not be the same as uh, you know the the process for uh, hybridizing uh, wind and solar. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I think we're kind of running out of time and running out of questions. Um, I, maybe um, unless Bo or Marco tell me otherwise, we can start bringing this uh, webinar to a close. Um, a little bit ahead of time or or later because i don't know if it was until 12 40 or until one uh but marco and, and bo can we um do we have any other questions or can we bring this to an end we we do have time for one more there's one more question that has been assigned thomas right. yeah here we go yeah there's one more question um so someone is asking um that in Chile um because there were a small volume of PPAs there was some financial product that <clears throat> was fixing a floor price um floor price in order to be able to to actually enable a project finance mechanism yeah I'm not sure what they referred by a financial product uh, but the question is whether you have seen something like this in Spain or in Iberia, I should say. Well, we have seen a lot of PPAs with floor prices, but I don't know if they're referring. But Chile is a special market with a lot of curtailments. Uh, there has been plants that signed PPAs and, and because they contracted certain production, they didn't produce and they are in trouble. So oh, it's, it's a very specific market, but in here there are a lot of transactions that had a, a floor PPA. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very typical, I would say it's a very typical mechanism, no? To introduce a floor, perhaps a, a, perhaps a discount over the capture price on the market, and also a cap, no? And then you have your color. That's a very typical mechanism that we have, that we're seeing in the market, no? Uh, yeah. Obviously, I mean, for uh, PPA pay as produce is probably the most popular one, but the this second one is a, is a is something that we're seeing. Yeah. 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 Maybe the question was just referring to a financial PPA um, as opposed to a physical PPA, so a financial PPA with a floor. And, and obviously, yes, we have seen many of those in the Spanish um, market and also in Portugal. All right. So I think that uh, that brings us to an end. Um, so last thing for me is um, thank you guys uh, very much again. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Fernando, for uh, participating in this in, in this um, webinar and, and sharing, I think, quite interesting insights um, about this, the, the Iberian market and, and on this in this relevant topic uh, that I'm sure we will continue as an industry, we will continue to talk about and, and to learn. Um, and we can see there are a couple of of uh, new events. So, Marco, I, I hand over to you for, for closing and for my end. Thank you very much as well. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, thank you to every member of the panel for such a comprehensive overview on the topics discussed. Uh, we will deep dive into these topics at the actual conference on the 5th of June in Madrid. 
which we're looking forward to. Please also remember in the audience to take advantage of our 20% discount that we've offered for the upcoming conference. And we also have an additional discounted code for France happening on the 27th of June in Paris, as well as on the 24th of October, we have our storage event in Spain. You should be able to see that on your screen. Please make use of the barcode or the discounted code that has been provided. And we look forward to seeing you at the conference on the 5th of June. Um, yeah. And one more thank you to our sponsors for the event. Thank you to our speakers, our panelists, and all of our attendees that has bought your tickets so far. We look forward to seeing everybody in the room and to have our successful networking opportunities. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, everybody else, Fernando, Alberto, and Roger. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye.